Well, thanks a lot, Doug. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I really like the introduction was terrific, but you know, my wife, I've been married to her for 28 years, and she's somebody who's always kept, kept me very humble. And just before I left for this trip, she said, Great, you're going to talk at the Dean's Convocation. What did I tell you to remember? Yes, get over yourself and don't take yourself too seriously because nobody else does. <laughs> so she has been probably the biggest force in my life and kept me very humble uh, and uh, has had a, a big influence on what I've done. And uh, the other thing that's kind of exciting, I took my son, he's 23, and he just graduated from Florida State. And uh, he also gave me some advice. as Dad, take it easy on the stories, okay? Finish on time. So I'll try to do those things for you today. Uh, I, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. I've just had a day and a half with some of the top leaders in, I believe, North America that are on the board that came together to put together a real uh, work with Bob Miller, the executive director, put together a vision uh, for the future of the Shingo Prize. It is the premier prize in my for excellence in business, in my mind, around the world. And you guys should be really proud that it's housed here in, in Logan at Utah State. What I'd like to try to do with you this morning and, uh, is to kind of really kind of tell, give you some background, first of all. I'll tell you about Medtronic, just so can you understand where I'm coming from in the environment. Talk about the business sector I work on, and, and I was really happy to see that so many of you know about Lean, have learned about it. And if you haven't, you better because I really believe it's going to change the world, and I'll talk more about it later on. Um, I'll tell you a little about the lean journey we've been on. Uh, I've been involved in continuous improvement for over 20 years, but in 1999, uh, it was an epiphany. Finally got it, and we really got going on our journey, and it's just been a tremendous journey as it goes on and on. I'll talk to you what I've learned about leadership in my 36 years in business. Uh, uh, as John Maxwell uh, said, you know, fail forward. Well, I fail forward a lot. But the only way you learn is to take those chances and those risks. And so I'll share all the things I've learned and try to put it into what I call the 10 Ps. And I'm going to use it within what I've done within a lean. And then finally, I'm going to talk to you about something I'm really excited about, and uh, the dean alluded to it, uh, taking lean into the community. It was an idea I had several years ago, and Jesus has been great just getting involved in the whole thing. So I'll share that with you as well, and maybe I can inspire you to try to do something like that as you come out of school and do that in your community. Um, just quickly on Medtronic. Medtronic's a world leader in medical technology. Uh, it's about $12 billion in sales. Uh, the original pacemaker was invented by Medtronic. It's coming up on its 50-year uh, anniversary. Uh, 38,000 employees... Uh, it's named year in and year out one of the 100, 100 best companies to work for. I can tell you, it's a great company. No company is perfect, but I feel very blessed that I have an opportunity to work for a corporation that stresses doing the right thing, serving other people, and a strong sense of ethics and values in business. It's not tolerated, anything other than that, if you're going to work in the corporation. Um, the thing that is really the hallmark of the corporation that really pulls things together, I... I don't know if any of you have really read John Cotter, but John Cotter in his book, Heart of Change, talks about there's the left side of the brain and there's the right side of the brain. The left side being the real analytical side, but if you're really going to make things happen, you've got to get the right side going. You've got to see something, you've got to feel it, and then do it. Well, that's, you, have, you have to have both sides going, but that's really the way you change things in any culture, in any organization. Well, the founder of Medtronic came up with this in 1960. He sat down to write a business plan to get his company going. And when he sat down, he wrote a mission. And the mission that he wrote was really tugs at the right side of the brain. It grabs you. He said, through biomedical engineering, he wanted to improve human welfare to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. Who can't get excited every day going to do a job where that's what you're doing? that you're helping people to that magnitude. And the neat thing about the corporation, you may have read about it, but there's a medallion that every employee gets. And when you come to the company once a year, as we have new employee comes, either the CEO or the chairman of the board will come to your location, and he will show you what the company's about. He'll show you how we're hope, helping people. And they'll ask you to come up and get your medallion. And they'll say, Jerry, welcome to the mission. And that's why I love working for Medtronic, and I just think it's a fantastic corporation to be able to do that kind of work and serve people in that fashion. 
It's also kind of staggering to think that every five seconds, somewhere, some, somebody in the world is either alive or living a better life because of our products. We have an awesome responsibility. And that's why lean, that's why operational excellence is so vital in the way we perform our jobs. Not only in manufacturing, but in everything we do. I'll tell you, the company, I, I, I joined this company called Zomed. And uh, it was founded in 1970, mainly dealing with ear, nose, and throat diseases and conditions. And in 79, Br Bristol Myers Squibb, a, a major corporation, acquired it. In 94, uh, Bristol decided to divest it, and a venture capitalist group from Wall Street, Warburg Pincus, bought the company. And uh, they, had, they wanted to grow the company and take it public. Well, they weren't too happy after two years with the management team, and I was one of them. So that's not a good thing, okay? And um, they got rid of everybody but two of us, which is me. It's good for me. <laughs> and uh, they, br they, they, uh, they brought in a new management team. At that point, we, they had blown through $18 million in cash, this group that came in in 94. We had the banks at our throats. Uh, we would sit, get at a table, these two guys they brought in who were really great professionals in the medical device industry. We'll talk about them a little bit later. And these guys came in, and we used to sit to keep the bank and figure out how we were going to pay the payroll. And they both invested in the business to keep the business going. Because Warburg, as I was talking to somebody earlier, they wanted to have some skin in the game. Well, they put some skin in the game. Well, those guys took the company public, paid off the debt, and they said, we're never going to owe any money again, and we're going to generate cash. And uh, took it to be one of a very, very successful company on Wall Street. It was a company that when they bought the when the company was sold in 1994, was sold for $84 million. These guys came in and drove the value up when they sold it to Medtronic to $830 million. Were these guys good? Were they good businessmen? Certainly were. Did they care? Their whole mantra was, take care of your customer, take care of your people, and your shareholders will do just fine. And they were those type of leaders, and I speak about them because they influenced me so strongly in terms of who I've become as a leader. ENT, neurological technologies. Uh, that's the business sector. It's one of six at Medtronic. That's the one I play in. I'm, I'm vice president of global operations. So we, we, we're closer to $600 million in sales. We deal with ear, nose, and throat, but... We have another uh, two businesses that deal more with uh, neurocranial repair. They deal with the spine and orthopedics. We have 1,900 employees. I have five manufacturing plants, four in the U.S. and one in France. Actually, the first plant we took lean was in France, and now they say, say bon lean. Mm -hmm. They love it, and they, the, their results have been very dramatic. We have 17,000 finished goods. We're like a job shop. We've got a high mix, low volume. So lean was a good fit for us. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot more time on, on this, but I just want to, we, 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 we pioneered least invasive surgery, and it's after lunch, so I guess it's okay. Uh, sinus surgery, laryngeal surgery, uh, we're even doing some spinal work right now, done least invasively. Uh, nerve integrity monitoring, if they're operating in your head, neck, or in your throat area, it provides a safety net for the surgeons to know exactly where they are. There's a whole range of products and the Microfrance instruments, which are the greatest quality instruments in the world. Um, and just quickly, I'll show you the picture. This is our XPS system. It's our largest platform. It represents about $85 million in sales to us and continues to grow. Um, and that's what the nerve integrity monitoring system do, does. Uh, they attach electrodes so the doctor will know where he is so he doesn't sever something. So if, if any of these devices fail, we've got a problem. We've got a huge problem. That's why they have to be right. Uh, our image-guided surgery system, where they can put trackers so they can take instruments to areas of doctors' sites they could never get to before. We pioneered a lot of this, and we're the market leader in this area. So let me talk about lean, and uh, there's all sorts of definitions, and it's really a strategy. It's not tools. And people say to me, well, when do you do lean? I, I don't understand your question. I just think that way. And so... What we did is, it's lean thinking, it's your brain. You know, this is a way of thinking, here. And that's what you have to do. It's just how you look at everything, processes and all. So it's a strategy to get rid of the rights, but really to deliver value to the customer. It's about the customer. And so, 
there's five principles, and, and Jim Womack wrote the book Lean Thinking, and it, that's what it boils down to. His genius is really being able to synthesize this information and, and say it very con, in, with concision. So specify value. Who specifies value? The customer. What happens in a lot of organizations? Who specifies value? The marketing department. Do they always talk to the customer? No. They think they know better. Well, at Toyota, it's go find out where the customer sees value and deliver value to the customer. Second thing is go map your process, not a portion of your process from when you develop the pro product until you get it to your customer. There's a value stream. You're trying to deliver value, and there's an enormous amount of waste. In a typical manufacturing operation, when you start out, 95% of, of what you do is non-value added, okay? And you can and, and, and you can elim 65 percent. You just got to stop doing. You just got to figure out how to do it. There's other non-value added things like accounting. The customer doesn't want to pay for accounting IT. So what do you do there? You do that as efficiently as you possibly can. I'm sorry. I'll go back. Um, I go back. I go back more. And then the next one is so you try to you take what you're doing now. And you try to put it into flow and you create a future state. So you map the process and then you go in and you do your Kaizens and your improvement events and you take the future state and then you map again and you take it to another future. It never ends. You want to get to pull. You only want to do things when they're needed. You don't want to batch things. Do them when they're required. And finally, people always say to me, well, how do you keep this going? You guys have been at it, at least on the lean journey, for over eight years. We're seeking perfection. You're never going to get there, so you have to maintain a healthy dissatisfaction and keep striving to get better and better. Um, I'm going the wrong direction. I'm sorry. Okay, where did this all come from? And you're probably familiar with it. It's really Toyota. Toyota really developed this. When I grew up in the 50s, you didn't want anything from Japan. It was junk. Okay, so after the war, so they could compete, um, Dichiano was challenged to come up with a way that they could compete. And where did they draw this all from? Well, Henry Ford, a lot of the ideas from Flo. Um, the American supermarket, their whole visual system and the Kanban is all based on the American supermarket. And they took many other things from us, but they put them together and they made them work. And the pillars of Toyota's whole philosophy rest on two things, continuous improvement and respect for people. And I can tell you, I was in Japan a year and a half ago with a friend of mine who grew up in Japan, got a chance to go to the Motomachi plant. I was totally blown away. I'd been to Georgetown, but you can feel it. That total respect for people and engaging it. They don't even call it the Toyota production system. They call it the thinking production system. And it isn't even a production system. It's a whole business enterprise. It's just new thoughtware. It's a completely different way of thinking. And I think of you, I think of you as the Y factor. I was reading an article in uh, Fortune magazine. And you guys are going to change the world. You know why? Because you, you're not going to take things at face value. You're going to question. I have two wives at home. I got my daughter and my son. And I'm experiencing When I read this article, it really hit home. So it's very exciting to me. And you're also going to be in the driver's seat. Because by 2010, 16 million of peop, baby boomers my, like myself are going to be retiring. Well, I'm not going to retire. But a lot of people. And, and you guys are going to be, you're going to really have the leverage. Because corporations are going to pay attention to you. So you have a real opportunity. It's exciting to think that there's a generation coming along that really can take this and do something fantastic with it. Um, how do we get involved, OK? We were doing really well in 1998. I mean, I, I'd have been applying what I thought was Toyota. And the guy who was the chairman said, you know, you, you got a great operation. I believed it. Believe me, I thought we were the. But he told me at a strategic meeting in July of 1998, hey, Jerry, uh, why don't you go out? I don't want the Baldrige. I want you to go find something that's going to help us provide the capability that we can really grow this public company because it was before Medtronic. I had a whole year to do it. I traveled around. I, I was confused. I couldn't see the roadmap. And all of a sudden, in March of 1999, uh, I saw this brochure about the shingle model. And it clicked. I said, wow, now I understand how lean and everything all fits together. Cool. I'm going to go to the conference. So I took five people with us. Well, we went to the Shingo conference in Columbus in 99. It was the most humiliating experience that I've ever been through in my life. I listened to people do things in one year that I couldn't do in 10 years. It was like, oh, my God, this is devastating. For 27 years, I haven't had a clue. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm a leader. I'm telling these people. We spoke. Well, I said, you know. So all of a sudden, we said, you know, we could do this. 
And we bought every book we can, Lean Thinking, and met Dr. Robson here, and we got into it, and we were going to go. And we came out. We didn't need a plane to fly back to Columbus. I mean, we were that lit up. We were, we were going to change every. Went back. I made the, went to the strategic meeting. I gave the pitch. It's a Friday afternoon. Everybody's getting ready for cocktails. I'm the last one. I've had about 12 cups of coffee. I'm all lit up. And I get up there, and this chairman starts up and applauds. And he says, this is the best thing I've heard in 25 years. Go do it. Wow. That was cool. So here's, here's what we did. Well, we were studying like crazy. We read everything we can. I started teaching the other executives. I was going crazy. And we, I sold the strategy to them. We're teaching people about lean. We got our implementation plans. And I get the green light to go. Well, guess what? I got the sale. Now I had to go do it. And I remembered at the conference, they said, go consult an expert. I'm going, like, who's an expert? Who do we know? Jim Womack, he's the guy that wrote the book. I've got to go meet him. The guys that work with me, they go, what are you, out of your mind? Why would he want to meet with you? No, I'm going to meet him. I'm from New York. I'm very persistent. <laughs> so uh, I said, you know, all right, I'm going to go. Up. And, we, we and you have to change the operation, conduct the value mapping, and start that. Well, here's, here's, here's the dean of lean, Dr. Jim Womack, uh, who's really had a, another guy who's had a profound effect on me in terms of what I've learned and all. So I saw calling Jim Womack up. And he, they don't want to take the calls. I finally talked to somebody at work. I just, I think Jim thought I was stalking him at one point. So he says, come to the conference in Cannes. I'm having it in September 99, and I'll talk to you. So I said, what the heck? This is great. He's gonna... So I get there the night before, and there's 1,000 people at this conference. I don't know anybody. I'm there. I got my golf shirt. We're on the Riviera. I've never been on the Riviera. I'm walking along, drinking a glass of champagne. I see Jim Womack. I go, wow. There's... So I go, hey, Jim, I'm Jerry Bustle. You would have thought it was a deer hit with headlights. He got this panicked look. He couldn't get away from me fast enough. So, you know, that really did a lot for myself. So what do I do? I put the drink down. I go up to my room. I get lean thinking, and I start reading. I almost pulled an all-night. I had this impression. He's like, he's at MIT. He's going to know I'm stupid. I don't know anything. I'm going to embarrass myself. I had so much highlighted. I never even read the book twice. I, I had so much highlighted, you didn't know what was an highlight. Uh, so I went, all right. So I got up. I started drinking coffee because I was getting tired. I'm drinking coffee, and all of a sudden, I walk down. It's the Carlton Hotel. Walk into Carlton. That's where the movie stars stay. I walk in. There's 1,000 people. I got my blue golf shirt in, and there's Walmack at the head table. <sighs> I'm walking. These guys, who is this guy? And I got my notes on everything. And I go down and sit down, and I, I go, uh, uh, so he says, Jerry, what do you have? You know, looks over the glasses. So I start to talk to him, and I get no more than three sentences. He goes, let me see if I got this right, Jerry. You're a dumb manufacturing guy who's read a book, and you're going to change your company. I said, you're darn right, I am. He says, keep going. He got up and gave a speech and uh, talked about our breakfast conversation, came off the podium and says, I'm going to adopt you. <laughs> and he did. We have not used consultants, and we've worked with Jim. We've enjoyed a very good relationship He's opened a network for us to meet a lot of people. But that, that was really my introduction to lean and lean think. And as a matter of fact, I'll, with some of the other guys here, I'll be up with Jim. He has his 10th anniversary of his Lean Institute next week. And uh, so that, that's been really a fun thing. And it really has made a big difference. This is a journey. It never ends. And this is from our plant in Jacksonville. And you have to realize that, you know, the shingo is at the bottom, best plants. We're trying to get up there. And once we get to the top, guess what? We gotta get down. We're going to go up again. We've got to keep striving for excellence no matter what we do. Um, I just want to emphasize this because there's a lot of people who are getting confused, and I think people finally have, There's a lot of tool heads out there. By that I mean they know how to use these tools. This isn't about using tools, okay? You need to be proficient, but you have to have the thought process down. You have to understand this is a strategy, and you have to approach it that way if you're going to be successful with it. There's been this raging debate between the Six Sigma guys and the Lean guys. You know what? I don't give a damn. Who, if you can improve your business doing it, go ahead and do it. But stop the fighting the bickering or whatever. Let's get together, and now it's called Lean Sigma, whatever. My, my, my premise is it's a way of thinking. I think the lean way of thinking, the way Toyota does. You know, the question was asked to Toyota, uh, of Fuji Ocho, a friend of mine asked him a question who was a reporter. said, what do you think of uh, Six Sigma? He goes, it's an American phenomenon. Don't you think we've been using statistics for 50 years? Sure, we use what we need when we need it, but we only use the tools we need uh, we, we probably use Six Sigma, and we, we do a lot of work. We probably use it less than 10% of the time in what we do. We're religious about the Dominic process. We just think that is great. 
but we don't use it. Um, so what happened? You know, we got on this journey. The first two and a half years, we were only doing about $140 million in sales, and today we're doing almost $600. And uh, uh, we had a lot of opposition at one point. Um, the guy who thought I was really smart, he left. The next guy that came in thought I was an idiot. Okay, and my wife said, what is he calling you at? That's my job. <laughs> um, but um, it was really tough. You know, we went through an awful lot to try to keep it going. And it, people are surprised. But in the first two and a half years, uh, we hit EBIT for $11.5 million on a $140 million business. And guess what? People think. And that was during a period when the sales slowed down. And all of a sudden, we were blowing the bottom line apart. It got people to believe, geez, this stuff works. Um, so the whole idea is not to just do a department or not to just do manufacturing. This is a manufacturing thing. You know, if you don't know it, I mean, Bank America is doing this. You know, you've got insurance companies like Lincoln Financial. Whether, you, whether you're moving molecules or you're moving information, everything's a process with a customer. And you can apply this everywhere. The tough leap that everybody had, well, it's a manufacturer. I can't physically see things. Well, that's the thing of the past because there have been pioneers out there that actually have done this and proved that it's worked. And, and it's so big. I mean, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, it's major initiatives in all of those branches. Uh, Department of Defense. So what we've done is we're, you got to work with your suppliers. You've got you to create that capability through your whole organization. And getting everybody involved, that capability will allow you to grow your business and to serve your customers. Uh, sales and marketing, we're just starting to do some work with, with them on it to try to help them take some of the time. They want to be in front of the customer delivering value. How do we take all the non-value-added activity away from them? Uh, so what does it require? It absolutely requires a passion. You know, it's like... For me, I, you know, some guys get it and women get it. It's, it's just like, it's like a virus. I mean, it just gets through. I mean, my daughter was going, I, I really had, she was going to Elon University. And she said to her mother, if daddy mentions the word lean one more time, I'm going to scream. And then I got to call her junior year. She calls me up and I'm like, hey, daddy, uh, I need a uh, One of the professors asked if anybody knew anything about lean thinking. And I told him, I gave him the definition. So you think you'll come up to the college and do a lecture? It was cool. It was a great feeling. <laughs> My wife didn't believe it when I told her. But you have to have the knowledge, you know, and that's what you guys get in school. You gotta, and if you're not learning this stuff, you're getting shortchanged with your education. You really are. I don't, in business, I don't want to do rework. I don't want to retrain people. Here's the opportunity to le learn this when you go to school. You'll be that and being able to lead this. You, you can do just about whatever you want. There's such a demand for people that have this ability to do it. It takes a commitment because you're going to run into some hard times. You've got to focus. And discipline. I, Jim, Jim Collins, if you've read Good to Great, Jim gave a talk at the AME conference down in uh, Dallas. And it still resonates in my, my ears. I, just, I see the word discipline people, discipline, you know, discipline actions, and thought that you get the results. You have to have the discipline. You have to have the discipline to what If you don't have the discipline, you'll be all over the place with improvement. And, and then finally, you've got to execute. And I'm not talking about G the GE, execute to get executed. I'm talking about you really have to get results. This is all cool stuff, but at the end of the day, you have to, del you have to be able to help uh, with the, uh, meet the business objectives. So, I, you know, I, I love to read. I mean, one of the things, I went back to graduate school. I tried to go twice, you know, and then my kids came along, and then I got an international job. Finally, I, I got transferred. I'm from Long Island. I, got I was telling people last night, I got transferred to Waco, Texas. You know, from, you're a city person. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and you go to Waco. And I was saying to somebody last night, my wife said, well, she, she didn't like it at all. You know, she still hasn't forgiven me. She said, okay, the rattlesnake ground up this weekend, the belt buckle convention next weekend. Does it get any better than this? <laughs> but what I did, it, I just created an insatiable appetite to learn. I mean, um, and it was really fantastic. And before I really get into it, one of the things that I, the last time I was in Utah, I was at, uh, up with uh, Covey Leadership Training. It was in 1995. I went for principal-centered leadership. You know, I became a Coveyite when I went to graduate school in, at Baylor. Because what happened, I was taking a managerial accounting course, you know, and, and accounting was my thing. I mean, I had to work really hard to get good grades. It's 11.30 at night, I'm doing homework. This guy, Dr. William Petty, gave us about eight books. He was going to impart all the wisdom in the world on us. And all of a sudden, I'm going, I can't do anything. I see this book, Seven Habits. And I said, what the heck does this have to do with accounting? Well, it has everything to do with that. It's about ethics and values. I stayed up that night and read half the book. I stayed up the next night. and said, Then I went into my company and said, we're going to teach each other about it. And that has had a big effect on me in terms of, 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 of Covey. And if you haven't read The Eighth Habit, you need to. 
It's, it's really tremendous. It really ties everything together with the habits and principle-centered leadership. What do I do in work? I have the guys that work with me teaching one another all the time. We repeat this stuff over and over. We teach because that's the way you really learn when you have to get out and teach. But there's tons of leadership definitions. I mean, Warren Bennis on becoming a leader is one of my favorites. It was issued in 1989. It came back again in 2000. It's a phenomenal book. A lot of guys have repeated what Bennis has said. And you really should, really, if you get a chance, read it. You'll get a lot out of it. Leadership's really a function of knowing yourself. And it really gets into the whole integrity issue, okay? First, you have to be honest with yourself. You've got to get to know yourself. Once you accept yourself, then you can go out to other people. You have to build a vision. I mean, when I started doing lean, I built a vision. I said the vision is, okay, we're going to do this, and someday we're going to win Best Plants, and someday we're going to win Shingo, and we're going to influence all of Medtronic to go lean. Well, we did all three because Medtronic, off of what we did, the whole corporation has gone lean. Who are we? We're average people. Okay? But we were given a brilliant process, and we got brilliant results, and it never ends. So with the definition, you have to have the vision. You build trust among the people, you take effective actions, and you realize your potential. This is not rocket science. But if you don't have integrity, you can't be a leader. I mean, Covey says it in spades to you. He says, you know, he goes through it. I mean, you're not going to be able to lead because nobody's going to trust you. It all starts with that. He showed it in Eighth Habit. They did a survey of 52,000 people, okay? And what was the number one thing, two to one, that they, the quality of a leader? Integrity. It's something nobody can ever take away from you. Um, so, and, and good to great, um, I really, the different levels of a leader, I mean, the ultimate is somebody who's humble, but also is very driven to drive his, his resolve. And there's very few, and that's what you all should aspire to. You know, I, I am a, I've, I've really become, been doing a lot of study. I'm trying to write. I don't know whether I'll write for myself, I guess, but I've been studying Abraham Lincoln. I've read about 25 books on him. Lincoln on Leadership is probably one of the best books I've ever read, and I've reread and reread. If he doesn't, and, he, and I, I, it amazes me because I said, maybe I should write something about it because what does he talk about? Who's the level five lead? Leader. Lincoln, they can criticize him for every, anything, but they can't. His integrity, his, you know, his, you know, his honesty, he built it around that. And that's why he was able to take that challenge on. There's so many parallels. It's incredible. So I would encourage you. It's a history thing, but, boy, you'll learn an awful lot. The other person is Gandhi. Spent an awful lot of time studying Gandhi. You can learn a lot from him, too, about leadership. Um, so I wanted to spend... Watch my time here. I really want to spend a lot of time on this here. This, is, this, is, this sums up what my take is on leadership. It's not just lean leadership. It's leadership in general. It's probity. And I use the word probity for specific. It's complete honesty. It's not being honest sometime. It's being honest all the time. You've got to commit to... Because integrity really is about keeping your commitments. It's telling the truth to yourself. You're keeping your commitments to yourself. You can't be honest if you're not honest to yourself. And honesty is about telling the truth to everybody else. And if you don't have it, you can call yourself a leader. You can make believe you're a leader, but you're not a leader in my book. Okay? So it's all starts with, it all falls apart. And you have to do that if you want to be successful as a business leader. Second thing is people. And, and the big thing that I learned, uh, you, know, I, you know, I talk about how where you learn things. My dad was a manufacturing guy. My grandfather was a manufacturing guy. I can remember his five-year-old kid being up on my dad's shoulder when we walked through the manufacturing plant on a Saturday, when, walking me around, and he was looking at things, and he's talking to me. Years of that went on. We talked at the kitchen table. He had a passion for his family. He had a passion for his spiritual life, okay? And he had a passion for his job. My greatest lessons came over the kitchen table about doing the right thing, no matter what. And, uh, you know, it sticks with me today. And up until he died with Alzheimer's, I took care of him the last two years. He was still teaching me lessons. When I started my business career, who would I call him? You know, and I got my best advice from that. And it was all based on his whole take on what was important and it was doing the right thing. Um, and in people and treating people with respect. And that's why Toyota is just absolutely fantastic. It's all built around respect for people. You know, I have 900 people in the manufacturing plant. I know everybody's by first name. How did I do it? I make everybody put a tag by their workstation. I have computer pictures of them. There is nothing more important to show people you care. And I make notes about their families. 
Dude, I spend a lot of time. I spend most of my time on the floor because that's I serve them. That's the only place I can deliver any value. I don't do it. Third floor of an executive wing. What can I do up there? The only way you do that is show them respect. Teach them. Give them an opportunity to do things. Engage them. That makes all the difference. And that's a big lesson from Toyota. Um, passion. Well, you got to have passion. You find, don't do anything if you can't get passionate about if you really want to fulfill yourself. Find something you love to do. You know, my son doesn't want to go into business, but he thinks he, he re, he's spent a lot of time in the courts you know, working and all that, and he, he thinks he might want to be a lawyer. I said, be a lawyer. Chase your passion. You know, I'll, I'll help you get there, but find something you really love to do. I don't feel like I work. You know, I really don't. I, and, you know, I, I work hard. I work a lot of hours. I'm, I love what I do. I can't wait to go to work every day. I, you know, people my age are going like, what? I love it. It's a blessing. God's given me a blessing to do work that I really love doing. Um, policy deployment. This is a very critical thing for anybody trying to improve a business. And what it's all about is you have business objectives. Well, what you have to do is align everybody in the organization as to what they should be working on. It's more important to figure out what you're not going to do than what you're going to do. Because first of all, you've got to get all that clutter out. And you want to align everybody to that. So it could be, for example, if you're trying to grow your business, what are the specific things you're going to try to improve to execute in that area? And you're improving at it. If it's, if it's trying to do financial, what are you going to do to reduce your inventories? What are you going to do, your quality? What are you going to do to build and get everybody to understand that what that is all the way through the organization? Because what people want to do is, what do you want me to do and why do you want me to do it? Well, this is a great way to do it. And this is what Toyota called Ocean Connery. This is what Toyota has been able to do so, so effectively. And we're doing it now in this company, other companies that are doing it much better than we are, but it's really making a difference in our corporate. It gets everybody aligned. Uh, persuasion. I'm going to give you something. It's out of Stanford. Uh, Robert C. Aldini. It's the best thing I've seen. I carry the card. I want to take it out now. I always carry it. He gives you six principles of what you have to do. And I'll let you, but it's a Stanford tape. It's absolutely phenomenal. We carry, everybody works when we carry these cards. You know, reciprocity, you know, and, and creating. You think of these basic things, they work. They really do work. So that's something that we use as we learn. Um, and Lincoln, I study him because there's nobody better. He could send people out of his office with the worst news and they felt good about themselves. It's that ability to, to be able to be very persuasive in an ethical way. Not trying to get over, making it a win-win situation, but letting them know that for the good overall that we have to do it. So that's a skill that you'll, you'll really need, uh, really serve. Persistence. I'm going to tell a story here, and I'm kind of watching the time, but it's my favorite story, so I guess I get to tell it. Okay? It's about my son, James. Uh, very proud of him. Um, he had minor cerebral palsy growing up, okay? And... Uh, I, I was a college athlete, not a great one, but I played Division II college. And my whole family did, my father and all. So this guy was a kind of a disappointment. So I worked with him until he was about eight years old to throw a ball. And he loved sports. And so he got cut from about every team that he could, you know, school team. But I always coached so he could get in. But he, he had this drive and this passion. He just loved it. So he went to high school and, of course, got cut from the basketball team. He could shoot like crazy because he was so persistent. But he was fairly short at the time and had, didn't have the coordination. So he tried out for the cross country team, and everybody makes the team. I have 150 kids, so he couldn't get cut. He had a uniform. He was thrilled. The first year, he was happy because there were 60 boys runners. And he'd go out there, and by the end of the year, he was number 54. And he, he dragged his left side a little bit, you know, and they said, you know, if you get. And his sophomore year comes in, and he's working. He's like Forrest Gump. Second year, this persistence. He's number 27. Wow. Termination. So he comes to me and says, Dad, I'm going to make the travel team. You have to understand, this is one of the top teams in the state. They bring kids in every year. And I said, you know, James, uh, listen, you know, as long as you do your best. And he said, Dad, don't step on my dream. He wouldn't talk to me for two weeks. And he went at it. Well, I'll fast forward. He was the number five runner on the state championship team and one of the all-time great runners in the school and went on to run in college. He didn't look pretty, but he was determined. And so I learned a tremendous lesson because during that time I had gotten systemic uh, uh, staffed and almost died. And he was the one that was encouraging me, don't give up. You can do it. And at the same time, they were thinking of stop and lean. Don't give up. Don't let them do it. Look at what I did. So I really tell that story because it shows that it's not impossible. When people say it is, it's impossible, it just, you just you haven't tried hard enough. You'll know when you, it, it outstrips you. So that was a great lesson for me in life. And, 
And something I said, oh, don't anybody tell you you can't do something. You go for it. You'll you know, give it everything you got, and you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. Process thinking, it really is about this. This is a way of thinking. It's systems thinking, okay? You've got you to gotta think that way in terms of process. This is, this is where you look at the whole process and you examine the process. It's a skill when you have it. I have so many people that they don't go. They go, okay, I know what the solution is. I've been doing it. It's just, I said, how would you possibly know? First of all, you haven't defined the problem. You haven't measured. You haven't analyzed it. So how do you know what to do? You've jumped the whole process. Do the process thinking. Understand the problem. Charles Kettering, the great inventor, said, Problem uh, well defined is a problem half solved. Understand the problem and follow a scientific method. It works. And this is a big change for a lot of people from my generation because we're all supposed to be so smart. We're supposed to have all the answers. Challenge people like me. Ask why. Ask why, as Toyota does. Problem solving. It's amazing, you know, uh, Toyota, they celebrate big problems. They think it's the greatest thing. It was a great story that I heard and um, Fujio Cho is now the chairman. I was one of these conferences. You pick up these stories. Mike Dupro was one of the vice presidents of manufacturing in Georgetown, Kentucky. And he had this problem on a Saturday. He couldn't, he couldn't figure out what he was doing. He's walking around. Who comes walking down? Fujio Cho at the time was the president of North America. It was Mr. Cho. He's got the suit on. He comes down. He goes, Mike, son, you got a problem. He said, yeah, let's sit down and solve it. And they sat down on the floor, and they solved the problem in 15 minutes. Now go home to your family. They enjoy solving problems. They th see it as a thing. They want to surface problems. Pe you don't, and that's an ethical thing. When people say, I have, when somebody says no problem, you know there's a problem, right? If people don't see problems, we say, okay, we'll show you. If you do see a problem and you don't tell us, you've got a real big problem. And that, learning how to solve problems, to have that ability to look at something and not jump ahead, that's where some of the measurement tools for Six Sigma are very valuable when you've got multi, multivariates you're dealing with. Uh, performance, at the end of the day, I said it comes down to execution. You've got to get the results. If you don't get the results, this is all for naught. But you have to manage, balance the tension between the short term and the long term so you can build that capability for the future. And finally, it's really about possibilities. You know, it really is. I mean, and I said it before I jumped ahead. Don't, you know, just because they say, well, Jim Walmack, we were walking through a facility in uh, Jacksonville, and it uh, was a Naval Air Depot. It's one of the toughest things when you, if you see what they're trying to do with continuous, it's tough. And one guy turned around and said, uh, geez, this is impossible. And Jim told, turned to me, and he kind of trained me. And Jerry said, it's impossible. I said, I guess we better start today. Because that's the attitude you have to have. You'd be amazed at what you could achieve. And it's dreaming about things. And it's trying to do things that other people just give up on. It makes all the difference in, in, in business. It's the same thing with the Medtronic. People thought I was a fool when I said, we're going to take this all the way through Medtronic. Well, it's there. It's, it's not a, we did it. We, we did it because we want to fulfill a mission. Now 38,000 people around the world are doing it because a bunch of guys got together and women in Jacksonville, Florida, and decide, hey, listen, we're going to impact the corporation. One of my favorite quotes, and you probably see him on the uh, ad for Lipitor, is Robert Jarvik's quote. Leaders are visionaries with poorly defined sense of fear, and no concept of the odds against them. They make the impossible happen, and you can too. Well, this was one of these crazy dreams that was the impossible, and I started talking to people in 2001. I said, geez, you know, this is great. It would be really great if we could take this into the community and take the whole city of Jacksonville, Lean, and North Florida. People say, you're crazy. I said, no, it's a great thing. So it took me two years to get people. And they, finally, people, I think, just said, if you shut up, we'll do something, you know? Because, you know, that's one thing about me. I just keep calm. Okay, all right. So, uh, so, what, so I live in Jacksonville, Florida. It's a great city. Uh, the dean was there. We had a great time down there. It's, uh, and uh, I got this idea to do this Jacksonville Lean Consortium. And I was invited to speak at the Jacksonville Business Summit for the Electric Authority. The guy from the Super Bowl, this is in 2003, I guess, he's talking. I get, and they said, well, we would like you to speak after him. So I get down there. I'm all excited. I had the whole vision. We're going to take the whole thing. We're going to take lean to, uh, well, I, I get up. I get there. I go, okay, where do I put my flesh? Oh, no, no, you're not talking here. This you're down here. Well, I was in a room. It's like a, 12 people in a room. I go, oh, my God. Yeah. I said, I don't care. I'm going to give the presentation anyway. I gave the presentation. In the end, this guy comes up and he says, I can help you. I said, what do you think? I'm nuts? He said, no, I'll get your money. He got me $375,000. Just so happened he had to be the CEO of Workforce. And, got to go. and that really gave the seed money. 
and we kind of get it. So we had a mission to collaborate to improve performance of business and organizations on the first coast to promote economic growth through the implementation of lean thinking. And uh, where we went from there with it was, uh, so it was founded in November 2003. I used the Manufacturing Association to do it. I uh, started with about 16 companies. We launched the second one in June of 2005. We launched the third one in 2007. We'll be up to 47 organizations in September that are all banding together to help make and, and, and help each other to implement this in every area. And I'll show you some of the areas. I founded it with the help of uh, uh, the president of FCMA, the manufacturer. It was modeled after the one in Vancouver. These consortiums exist all through Canada. Um, and provided and share the resources. So where has it gone from here? Um, here's the kind of companies that are in it. There's a shipbuilder, Atlantic Marine, aerospace company, uh, the Electric Authority, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, trying to become the first sheriff's office in the world to impl implement lean throughout his whole. And he's been written about nationally. And he's a zealot about it. He's a great leader, and he's a zealot about it. Aerospace, Medtronic, the Navy, um, WorkSource, and... Uh, we go to the next list. The green one's are transactional. That's what I'm trying to emphasize. It's just not about manufacturing. You do this stuff anywhere. Armor Holdings, Sintas, that's a big, big company, a billion and a half. City of Jacksonville Building Department, the Florida Community College. We're developing a whole curriculum there so we can take it through the, to offer it to the community. And as it goes on and on, but you get an idea of the companies. Uh, we actually have the, e the EPA there. Um, so what was our, what's our philosophy doing? It should be the same for you guys in school of how, how we do it. What you do is the beginners, you know, it awakens and all, so you, you go do something, you know, and that's how you learn. And then to really be good at it, you go teach others. This is not a thing you learn in the classroom. You know, you go do it and you learn it by being hands-on. And you learn it by working with people that have done it already. I mean, this is incredible thought where it's transformational. The stuff that you can achieve is just phenomenal. So here's Gandhi, and this is the University of North Florida, and, and this is the philosophy I have, and, and I, you know, I talked about my days in Baylor, and it's not about me, but it, it really, live as if you're going to die tomorrow, learn as if you're going to live forever. It's the biggest intoxicant. I get on planes reading. I can't wait to get off the planes. These guys at work, what, what do you read now? What do we read next? It's creating a learning culture. I mean, it's so exciting that you can learn and do things. Uh, you know, leaders really are the people, you know, they say, like Covey says, here's the unheard, you know, sees the unseen, you know, they, they can see things, you know, they can see the connections. When you read like this, all these connections, this stimulus helps you to grow and develop as a person. Um, and here's Jim Womack, and what happened was I invited Jim down a year and a half ago to come, and I told him we're going to, so, Here's a quick story with him as I try to finish up here. Jim came in, and I, I said, uh, we're going to go and meet a couple of friends of mine. I said, yeah. He said, I want to try to really, you be the catalyst in the city of Jacksonville. So we're going to meet the sheriff, and we're going to meet the mayor. But we're going to go meet my dentist first. And Jim says, now, <laughs> I'm getting worried about you. We went in to meet my dentist. And Jim came, and, and he's one of the people, among many people that I've been able to convince to come to Jacksonville so we could learn, extend this whole learning thing. And uh, so what happened was, uh, Jim signed his book. What happened was he came to my dentist, it was Sammy Bari. Sammy, who uh, gave a presentation to the Shinga, he's going to fundamentally revolutionize dentistry because he's applied this to dentistry. And he, he did it out of books and all. Now that he's gone to some operations, it's just absolutely incredible. He just spoke at Wharton about six weeks ago to a major group on this at, at Wharton. I mean, the guy is so passionate about this stuff. But he's, you talk about applying it, so he applied it to dentistry. And so Jim was like, his mouth was open. I, I didn't do those pictures. but, And Jim said, I want to hug you. You're the leanest dentist on the planet. <laughs> and at the Shango conference, he actually put two dental chairs up there and actually de demonstrated. And it's the real deal. You go in his office, you never sit. It's flow. You're the center of the whole thing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And he's become a good friend of mine. That's, that's the benefit. When you do stuff for other people. Well, we, we, we went ahead with the thing. And... I was give, gave the talk, and the mayor is on the right. He will not let me stand next to him. I'm 6'6", and he's about 5'3". So sit down. You know. but, and uh, and there's, the, uh, there's Jim, and there's the guy that got me the 375, so I thought I'd put him in the, in, in the picture there. But we went in to see uh, the sheriff, and the sheriff's a zealot. And Jim admonished him. He said, you're not looking at your critical process. So what did the sheriff do? He called an off-site retreat the next week, brought in a facilitator. 
And what he's doing is really phenomenal. He's, doing, he's, he's, got, he's trained over 2,000 people. They're doing Kaizens every day. He wants that to be his legacy. Not out of ego, but he wants to make a difference. And uh, then we went to see the mayor. And Jim said, this is going to be a grip and grin, right? So we go to, well, get two and a half hours later, he gets invited to the, to the mayor's office uh, for his staff meeting the next day. And then out of this, the Lean Enterprise Institute si signs a partnership with the city of Jacksonville, try to take him and make it the first city in North America to go lean. So think about it. As you're entering your careers, I'm an average guy of average intelligence. The guys that we work, we're not, we're not the smartest guys, but we have that determination and the persistence and did that. So these are the guys that the mayor and the guys along those lines. Um, I, I, I'm really going to employ you and urge you. Be the change that you want to see in the world, okay? Model that behavior as you go forward. And I'll finish with saying, you know, service to others is the rent we pay for living on this planet. And I really believe by serving others, disciplined lead lean leaders, with disciplined lean thoughts, and disciplined lean actions, will significantly improve lives, organizations, communities, and change the world. How about you? Thank you very much.